All right, I am live on this, what is it, Saturday afternoon? It is Saturday, isn't it? It sure is. What an incredible week it was, what it was this week. Hello, Titch. How are you? Hello, Dave. <laughs> Hi, Dave. I just saw Dave. Just wait for. Hello, Ellie's come to say hello. Let's come say hello. Come on. Then. Come here. Oh, come on. Okay. Well, she's going to get a ball. Come on. While everybody joins the stream. Up. Oh. Up. Oh. This is Ellie. Hello, Ellie. Hey, everybody. Yeah, I'm just waiting for people to um, to join the stream. Um, I thought I'd go live on Saturday afternoon and have a talk to you uh, about what's gone on in the, and what's going on in the world. And um, what an absolute shit show it is. <laughs> it's quite incredible. If you were... A, if, it was a ra if it was a reality TV show, if it was a TV show, it'd be cancelled by now for being on too unrealistic. <laughs> Hi Sarah, how are you? All right, so I've got my, my computer here anyway, so I can look up anything that we want to talk about. I've got my keyboard here. Um, I haven't gone live today on YouTube. I've only gone live on TikTok, and there's a reason for that, because I think I went live last on Excuse me while I move everything around. I think I went live last on Monday. And I went live simultaneously on YouTube and TikTok at the same time. And to do that, I have to obviously run through software on a computer. It gets quite technical. And it gets quite difficult to be able to, you know, really concentrate on what you're talking about when you've got, you, you've got so much you have to control. Whereas on TikTok, I can just put my camera at my face and, you know, talk. And I did all that. And went through all that. And on TikTok, I had over 5,000 views at the end of it. I'm not sure whether they do a replay or anything, and you get more views after that. But at the time, at the end of it, I had got 5,000 people who'd watched me at one time or another. And, you know, people jumped in and out. Um, and on YouTube, I had something like 234 views. Um, and, you know, it's been up on YouTube now for a week. And they just don't show it to anybody. They just don't show it. My my whole ch channel on YouTube has been switched off. 572 views that video's got. They don't recommend it to anybody. But if I went to the, into the stats of that, like most of those people would be people who are subscribed to me. They don't show it to anybody else. So I thought, well, you know, I won't bother doing all that. I'll, what I'll do is I'll go live on this, on TikTok, and record it, download it, and then just upload it to YouTube tomorrow or something. Um, and my uh, subscribers there can watch it there. Sarah, hi. Oh, good. I'm glad you're good. I had to stop watching the news for two days. They they was doing my head in. It's um it's an assault on your mental health, isn't it? Watching the news at the moment and watching what's going on. I mean, I for those of you who uh, don't know, I I also do a lot of writing as well. Go over to my website. I did a, an article this week on um, the whole situation in the UK and the fact that it doesn't really matter who the prime minister is. Nothing really is going to fundamentally change, not under the system that we have. It's almost impossible. And how, you know, no matter who was prime minister, it, it, this Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss, these, these televised arguments they are having at the moment, or they have been ha having, um, it, it basically what it boils down to is these two people are blaming each other 
for policies policies that they supported while in cabinet positions in government for the problems and the dire situation that we are in, while saying that they alone can fix the problem by offering variations of the same policies that they have always implemented that got us into this mess in the first place. And it's it's kind of like when you look at it like that, you think, wow. And this is our democracy in the UK. This is our democracy. You know, the, the, the voting on it has finished now. Not that you got a say in it. Not any of you did. Not unless you were a member of the Conservative Party. 160,000 people who are predominantly, you know, older, richer white men who live in the South and posh places in London, they decide, they're deciding who our Prime Minister is. And that's democracy this time in the UK. Um, and it doesn't really matter, really, whether they, who they choose, really. Uh, and that's the whole point of it. Um, even if you got Keir Starmer, and the Labour Party, anybody in the Labour Party, or Caroline Lucas, or whoever is leader of the Liberal Democrats right now. Quick, without looking it up, who's liber leader of the Liberal Democrats? Does anybody know? Because <laughs> honestly, I don't. And I can't even be asked to look it up either. I'm not even curious. Um, because it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter which one of them is Prime Minister. We're going to get the same no matter who's in power, you know? I remember Tony Benn, the great Tony Benn. There's, there's an interview where, and when I upload this to YouTube, if I find the speech, I'll, um, I'll cut it in. But he's basically saying that there's, a, there's almost a, a, a conspiracy, a theory that uh, within the Labour Party, that powers within the Labour Party were trying to change the Labour Party in the UK and its model was the Democratic Party in the US. They were trying to change the Labour Party into the Democratic National Committee over in the US. Um, and by what he means by that is he, they were trying to change the political system in the UK to that of the US in which the, you don't have a left-wing party. You have two right-wing, pro-corporate, pro-war uh, pro-establishment parties and you have the illusion of any real choice and like I say Tony Benn did that speech and if you actually look at the situation right now well I mean if there was uh, if there were powers trying to get that done then mission accomplished you know and Talking about, we'll talk about the Biden thing later if you want. Wow. Did you see that speech? Did you see the Biden speech, people? Hi, Ayat Santry. How are you? Hi, Connolly's Ghost. Sorry, bro. I have to go. See you later. <laughs> no no worries mate no no stay i don't accept your apology <laughs> agree but we voted for someone who wasn't good enough says magda i did i don't think any of them are the the, the whole point is um you know the, the system that we have won't allow anybody who would change the system and be a threat to the system to become prime minister and you really don't have to look far to see evidence of that. You really don't. You know, if anybody was a threat to that system, it wouldn't matter, would it, if they were the most peace-loving, anti-racist person or politician that the House of Commons had ever seen. The state and media would... I mean, this is just a theory, just a conspiracy theory, of course, but the state and media would call that peace-loving... Uh, anti-racist person uh, a racist anti-Semite who hated the Jews and was a terrorist sympathiser you know they'd never get near you see my, did you see my point it doesn't matter 
We have the illusion of a democracy. That's what we've got. We've got we have, we don't have any real choice in this country. You don't really have any choice. We have a theatre going on down there. And the illusion of a choice. And it's the same in America right now. If you if you haven't seen it, go and watch Biden's speech. The one with the backdrop. You'll quickly find it on Google or Twitter or anybody or anywhere. And just go and watch. I've I've only seen like the first bit of it, the first half, but He's talking as if the United States is some force for good in the world and always, always fights for dem democratic values wherever it is. And he's, he's talking as if, you know, he, this, this war that he's going to have on MAGA Republicans, as he calls them, this war that he's going to have on them uh, is protecting democracy and democratic values. It's like, come on. Whilst at the same time, and you know, whilst at the, and and, tr and the truth, that's what he says. Whilst at the same time, they are prosecuting Julian Assange for proving that America have got this false sort of. You saw what WikiLeaks proved in 2016 that Hillary Clinton basically bought the nomination. Um. She didn't rig it. She bought it. The nomination for Democratic. Um, again, and she, she's the only person who possibly could have lost to Donald Trump in the whole of America. Bernie Sanders would have wiped the floor with him. He really would have. Because Bernie Sanders is somebody who appeals to both sides of the aisle, not just because he appeals to the working class. And Yeah possibly why he's not in the Democratic Party. I've repeated this over and over, this joke. It's from years ago. It's from a sketch show, I believe. Um, and this is from the 1960s. I think it was Dudley Moore, the sketch show. But there's an Englishman and an American, and they're talking. And the, the Englishman says, so what's the difference between American and... British politics and the American says so in America we've got the uh, the Republican Party which is the same as your Conservative Party back at home it's like okay right and then we've also got the Democratic Party which is the same as your Conservative Party back home and that was in the 1960s and I fear that we our model in the UK has become almost exactly the same as it has be, become in America. We've got a false choice. It's like, and we're not really, we've got this, this illusion that we're actually voting on our future when really it doesn't matter who's prime minister or president. The foreign policy of the United Kingdom and the United States just continues non, unabated, doesn't it? It doesn't matter. Whether it was under Blair or whether it was under Obama or whether it's under Biden or Trump or or Cameron, or May, or Boris Johnson. It doesn't matter who is president or prime minister. The foreign policy of the country never, ever changes. It's pro-war, it's pro-corporate, it's pro-America in this country, whatever America wants we go along with. And in America, it's, you know, we will go and interfere in everybody else's democracy and democratic values, but don't you dare interfere in our affairs. How dare you? You know, right now, right now, we are condemning Russia for anything that they are doing in Ukraine. And by the way, some of the reporting or repeating, as I like to call it, coming out of Ukraine is diabolical. It doesn't matter how thinly sourced it is or wh whoever, whatever person uh, is, is making whatever outlandish claims. It's repeated in the media as if it's true because it's anti-Russia. And it's so disingenuous. You know, the, the Ukrainian, the one Ukrainian lady, the head of like the, the, the human rights, I think it was, had to resign because she was making outlandish claim, claims. I've written about it. I've done videos about it. And they were repeated in the media in this country as if they were facts at the time. There's been no withdrawal of those claims whatsoever. 
And yet everybody, in, it doesn't matter which outlet there was, they all repeated them. And while they're doing that, they're not telling the country, oh yeah, America are actually occupying a third of Syria right now. And it just happens to be the resource-rich third of Syria, which includes the wheat and the oil. And if you, you know, I, on Monday I showed, they're stealing 80%. 80% of, according to the Syrian figures, this is, but I, I, I think I've got no reason to believe that they're not accurate. 80% of Syria's daily production is currently being stolen by America. And that's without looking at the Golan Heights and the gas that, you know, and the occupation there. Meanwhile, they're pointing fingers all over the world going, look how terrible you are. You're not abiding by the rules-based international order. Meanwhile, America are just breaking these rules. They, you know, they're exceptional. The rules don't apply to them. And it's the same with the UK as well. If you actually look, well, I'm, I'm wondering what the statistic is. For those of you who don't know this, um, on country that is the biggest threat to there's a poll every year that I think it's um, here we go I, I, I know it's, it's almost every year that they hold this poll and this was in 2017 which country is the greatest threat to world peace? Um, and this is from an uh, from uh, from uh, brilliantmaps.com slash threat to peace. And there's a there's a poll anyway they're writing about, and it's every year, and they go to a cross section of each country around the world, and with a simple question: Which country is the biggest threat to world peace in the world? What do you think in the chat? Let's go down to the bottom and see who's, who, who is the biggest threat to world peace in the world. Let's see what answers come up. Please, you know, answer me. America, says Tom Burton. First answer, America. Tichoma, America. Mari, Mari Ghana, America. Uh, Rap says USA, but only when Republicans have, hold power. USA says Time NT. Hosein Diza says US. Atoyot 01 says something different. Israel, although that's not necessarily different. Mantor thinks America and Britain. Sarah thinks America and the UK as well. David says the, uh, the US. So you can see there, this is not an, an unpopular opinion. This is popular opinion. A fully working toaster says Brazil if they talk to the Amazon. It, it could have a point there. You know, they are the lungs of the planet, planet after all. Well, you see the point. And every year they go to countries around the world and they say, what is the biggest threat to world peace? And in 2017, if you asked Americans, Canadians and the Brits, they would say Iran. They would say Iran. That's the cross section of people there. So it's quite interesting, isn't it? To, so those people have been obviously... Um, exposed to their media in those countries. America, Canada, the UK, say Iran. How many countries have Iran uh, invaded? Or how many pe uh, people have, how many innocent people have Iran killed elsewhere uh, uh, in the world over the last, I don't know, 100 years? Can anybody tell me? You know, it's not. How many, how many of the, the, the hijackers on 9-11 were Iranian, you know? Um, it's quite interesting, isn't it? And if you actually look at the, the history of Iran, Iran would have a real big beef with us, considering, you know, if you listen to our media, the, the records go back to 1979 and, and the Islamic Revolution there and the hostages, etc., uh, at the embassy with the Americans and what have you. But actually, you need to go back to 1953 and the coup and Mohammed Mossadegh. 
who was the first dip diplomatic, uh, the first democratic leader of Iran, and wanted to nationalise the oil. <laughs> and BP went no, and Churchill went no, and asked America to join them in the coup, and Ike Eisenhower did. And that's if you actually look at it, and they get we think Iran. If you ask the people in America, Canada, and the UK, we think Iran's the threat. Well, if they are, they've got it. I think they've got they're warranted. If you, but if you go elsewhere, everywhere else in the world, pretty much everywhere, in India they say Pakistan, but pretty much everywhere else say America. And it's not even close. If you go by population, the US was the overwhelming choice. But if you ask the whole world as a whole world, 24% of respondents said America, 24%. That's including the the Western world. This was followed by Pakistan, 8%, China, 6%, and Israel, Iran, and North Korea were 5%. Respondents in Russia, Respondents in Russia said 54%, 54% of them said, said America and 49% China. But the largest percentage of people, it's America, 24%. And then actually, if you looked at the whole, nobody really got above 2% other than that, other than America. You know, it was the number one threat to the world. And yet there's Biden in this speech, basically saying that he has to protect democracy and democratic freedoms. And they're going to go after these MAGA Republicans. And I'm, I know how they're going to do it, how they're going to start doing it. I can tell you that they're going to start doing it with censorship, censorship online. Anybody questioning the narrative? I don't know. Anybody questioning narrative? Anybody questioning elections for sure? Anybody who's pro Donald Trump? Anybody who starts talking about anything that, that the establishment in the US wouldn't don't want you to talk about? So they might start, you know, clamping down on people who talk about Epstein and Maxwell and, um, you know, and all sorts of other things that we know have been swept under the carpet. Any, but maybe anybody who questions anything about 9-11 or the JFK assassination, all of a sudden these people are going to be silenced. And they're doing it at the same time as going after. He's preaching, um, we're going to do it for the Constitution at the same time as going after Julian Assange. Literally trashing their Constitution and the, the right to a free, a free press and free speech with this censorship. I've, I, I've said all along, America are not going after Assange. They don't really want to go after Assange. They're coming after you. Assange is just in the way. It starts with him and it ends with you and your free speech being taken from you. And there's this sort of almost theatre being played out at the moment where, you know, you've got people who are Republicans saying that Joe Biden and the Democrats are, are the radical left. When Joe Biden and the Democrats are center right, they're a center right, pro-war, pro-corporate. Yeah, party, pro-censorship, pro-FBI, pro-CIA. That's what they are. And they're turning the Labour Party, they've turned the Labour Party in this country into that as well. So we don't really have too much of a choice as to what goes on, do we, in this country? Don't really have, you know, what vote we have, it doesn't really matter. The only vote we had that mattered, I think, in our lives was Brexit. And look what a shit show that turned into. And we can do things so much better. We've got the technology to do it now. I've said for years that if you actually, you know, I've said for years that any one person in this country does not have the solution to the problems that we face. Not any one person. So nobody really has the answer. But in a way, all of us do. 
um, if you use wisdom of the crowd and you couple technology with wisdom of the crowd, I'm pretty sure that you could have a democracy that would pretty much solve any problem that we faced and be quite happy to do it. But that's being withheld from us and we're, begin we're being given some, some sham that, you know, every few years, four or five years, we vote as if, you know, if our side wins, then all of our problems are going to be solved. <laughs> of course they're not. These people are not going to solve yours and I's problems. And especially coming over there in the coming years. It's quite sad. Anyway, I went on a bit of a rant then, didn't I? I can't even remember what the question was. Mia says American people will wake up when it's too late for them to find out. I, I, I worry. Um, I worry they're never going to wake up at all. It's the same with the UK. You know, if, if there's anybody right now who's who's commenting on this this Labour conservative nonsense as if you know that's our future, then you know what planet are they on? Look at look at what's going on. Look at what we're propping up. Look at what we're putting up with as a people. We went, we had the pandemic and I've got to be careful what I say here because I'm on TikTok. But we were told we got to, we got to get this thing and we got to all shut down and we got to link all in arms and we got to rely on the essential workers. And they're, cause they're, and they're the people that we're really going to have to look after because, you know, Let's face it, we didn't need any bankers, did we, during the pandemic? When the shit hit the fan, <laughs> we, <laughs> when the shit hit the fan, we didn't need any of them. So, they basically got us through the pandemic. The health workers, the essential workers, the bus drivers, the, the train drivers. You know, these people, they, 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 and look at how they've been treated afterwards. It was all, don't worry, we'll sort you out afterwards. The pay cut that these people were given and took to say, oh, we'll take a pay cut, we'll get through this pandemic, we'll help you. They wouldn't even give them that pay cut back. And when they threatened to strike and, the, and Labour, the Labour Party in Tottenham, all voted unanimous, unanimously, yes, we're going to support this strike. The Labour MP for Tottenham, I think it's David Lammy, went on TV and said, I don't support this strike now. Well, I mean, your party was founded on unions. So aren't you proving, therefore, we don't have, or there isn't any democracy in the Labour Party? Isn't that proof? that what the, Labour, the members of the Labour Party want, you will not abide by? Because you know better? Because, you know, if you want to be serious at politics... So are we going to wake up, you know, to go back to your question? Is it going to be too late for us? And we're, we've put it, we're putting up with this. I mean, for how long? There's signs with the don't pay and the energy crisis that we're going to fight back. My my opinion is we should just, just stop. Just should just stop. And when they threaten us, we uh, we court. We should just say, all right, and okay, we'll um we'll get our, we'll, we'll we'll see you in court, and we'll need some um we'll need, we'll need some we need a barrister and some lawyer, please. We'll need that on the state. The barristers right now are on strike, remember. <laughs> you know, because they, they, the government won't pay them enough to represent people who can't afford justice, I suppose, in this country. 
So if the if the, the energy companies don't pay the energy company, and and if the energy companies say, oh well, you know we're gonna we're gonna come and install a meter, just say okay, go on then. But you'll not get through the door, and you'll have to you'll have to do it about six million of them. You know, and then we'll all come together, and if ever they do come out to put some uh, force a meter in somebody's house, we'll get the whole street to come out and block that house, so you can't do it. Brilliant. No, will we do it? No, I don't think so. That's the way that you fight back against it. These energy companies have made a fortune. This is not a cost of living crisis. I keep saying this. These energy companies have made billions, trillions since they've been privatized in this country. The water company is the same. Ah, oh, UK Water Company Director Bonuses. So, you know the water companies, they're basically, in the UK, they're shoveling, well, excrement out into our waterways and our seas and our beaches. This is from The Guardian. Uh, Friday the 19th of August. I don't like The Guardian. They are fake news when it comes to Julian Assange. Uh, bonuses for water bosses in England up 20% last year despite sewage failures. Water companies executives received on average, on average, £100,000 in bonuses. Despite most firms missing targets. Most firms have missed the targets and you've given them £100,000. Well, you've got, you're giving them no incentive to actually fix the problem if you're giving them an average of £100,000 in bonuses. And that was just last year. Figures show on average executives received £100,000 in one-off payments on top of their salaries during a period in which foul water was being pumped for 2.7 million hours into England's rivers and swimming spots. If you, I mean... Wow. I mean, if you ran a, if you or I ran a company where it didn't matter how badly we ran it, we would, ke we would keep getting our exorbitant wages, which are £600,000 a company on average. You know, we're from the, that's the bonus pool, £600,000 a company. So God knows the, the wages are going to be hundreds of thousands, probably millions of pounds. Water company director salary. The chief executive of Wessex Water, Colin Skellett, received £462,000 in, 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 in salary and bonuses in 2017. So you're talking half a million, some of these people are on a year. For what? There's literal shit been flowing into the sea and the rivers. Literal excrement. Finding its way into people's mouths who were swimming on the beach in Bournemouth. Why are we allowing this to happen? This makes no sense whatsoever to be privatizing these companies and allowing these companies to then shit literally all over us, but get hundreds of thousands of pounds in bonuses while doing it. You are, you and I, you and I business, our business would go under so fast if we did that. Yet these people not only stay in their jobs, they get rewarded for it. And then when the shit goes, when the shit literally hits the fan, people have to pay even more. BP director bonuses. The BP boss, Bernard Looney, was awarded 2.4 million in bonuses in 2021. That was his bonus.
February 18th, 2022, the Times newspaper, BP Boss awarded £2.4 million annual bonus as oil prices surge. Bernard Looney's total pay package, which also includes a salary of £1.3 million, is likely to more than double uh, to at least £4 million, thanks to the bonus revealed in a stock market filing this week. But your energy is going to have to go up 80% in four weeks' time. It's already gone up 50-odd. It's going to go up another 80%. Uh, in the beginning of August, uh, October rather. And then in January, that's only three months, so they've changed that. It used to be six months that they did it for, but they've changed it now to three months, and it's going to go up again in January, and they're estimating another 50%. But then they estimated less than 50% for this increase coming up, and it ended up being 80. They said 40 to 50 But yeah, we've got to keep paying our bills though, because otherwise they'll send the bailiffs round. Well, they can't send them round to everybody, can they? If everybody went, no. We, we've got to take a leaf from the French in the UK, I think we have. Remember with the, with the French? I think they've got parking meters in Paris now, I think. But when they tried to implement them, to a man, the French just went, no. And all bought super glue and started going around and super gluing the locks. So it costs the, the more to be, uh, more to actually repair the parking meters than it did. I think they've got them now, but we've got to learn from the French, and we, you know we've got to learn how to protest in this country. Fluffy says, "If you're real, can you touch your nose, please?" There you go. I'm not drunk, honest officer. Philosopher. Hey man, just wanted to say blah blah blah. Thank you. Server says we need to stand together and not fall for their division tactics. We need to stand together and not fall for their division tactics. Especially, we are stronger together. Yeah, we are. There's more of us than there are of them. Pentagram Motorsport says, we're all too British and polite for that, sadly. We do need to... Well, we do need to come together and, and, and fight back against this because it's clear that Certainly to me in America, and I know I'm in the UK and I talk about America a lot, but I think, you know, a lot of the problems in the world stem from them. Like I say, 24% of the planet, if you ask them, think America is the number one threat to world peace. Um, and if you look at the last 20 years especially, then it's clear that that's the case. These are unconstitutional wars that are being waged around the world. And it's not even the ones where missiles are being launched and from drones, etc. It's the, you know, the sanctions. It's the cybercrime. It's the, 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 the blackmail. You know, it's, the, it's all of that. It's all of the above. And it's not, you know, it's so on. It, the thing is, it's so unconstitutional. That's the thing that really sort of gets in my throat. And I'm from the UK. You know, I'm. If you actually, there are people in the U in the US who are on the right. So I don't like looking at things in a left right, um, through a left right lens, so to speak. I think it's. I think the whole left right thing is just something that's almost. It's a prism that we have to view things uh, through. That the media get us to look the look through uh, to sort of keep us all divided. You know. Um, but there are people on the so-called right in the Republican Party in, in, in the US who are right on certain things. And you were, when I say right, I mean, they agree with the lefty, left people on the left. They agree with them. And I don't mean Democrats, because Democrats aren't on the left. 
All right. The same as the Labour Party isn't on the left in this country. It's a center right. Part. It's getting towards the center right now. Labour is. But the people on the true left, you know, people like Tony Benn, people like Jeremy Corbyn, people like Bernie Sanders, although he's not really that left wing. He's not that radical. <laughs> you know, in, the, in, in Sweden, he'd be a centrist, Bernie Sanders, uh, Bernie Sanders would. But they get us to look through that left, left, right sort of lens because it can be warped. And people don't really know what the left is anymore. You know, if you're calling the Joe Biden and the Democrats the left, then, wow, they've really done a number on you. They really have. Um, sorry, I keep getting a call coming in and they don't, they just won't take the message that <laughs> I'm, I'm busy. Um, they where was I yeah they, they, they're not on the left the Democrats aren't if you, if you actually look at them they're pro-war they're pro-corporate you know they're pro-business you look at where they get their money from they're pro-pharma they get their money from the military industrial complex from pharma from pharmaceuticals you know um if you, if you want to know who controls a, company, a, a, a political party, look at where the funding comes from. You know, I lost my train of thought because that call came in. Sorry, everybody. I forgot the point I was trying to make. Yeah, so... The point I was trying to make is, you know, the left position, the position of the left, the real left, not just in the UK, US, but the UK as well, is anti-censorship. Because the left knows that if you start censoring, it's the left that really you start coming after. And people who are, you know, pro-Palestinian voices, etc., etc. You know, people in there who are, you know, pro-Julian Assange. There are certain people in, in, in the UK, in the US and certain people in the Republican Party you can work with because you, you, you agree with them on, on certain issues, like certain issues of free speech um, and issues of, you know, the, the, the sticking to the Constitution and anti-war as well. So, but you're being told you can't, even when those people, even when those people are right, you can't, you have to, you have to attack them because they're your enemy. But even when you agree with them, you've got to. Well, that's ridiculous. Why are you dividing us like this? Why are you trying to divide people like this with a rhetoric that's false? Ah. Oh. Is it because it really is all a big club? Eh? And we're not in it. But you are, aren't you? You all are, aren't you? In Labour and the Conservatives, you, you MPs, you're all in the big club. You're in the big club over there and the Democrats and the Republicans, aren't you? But not people. How much has America sent Ukraine? How much? How much money has it sent Ukraine in weapons? Now, remember, I want you to remember something. Let me get the figure up. Let me get the... Um... While it's talking about... Remember, while it's talking about sticking to its amendment and sticking to the Constitution while Biden in that speech was going, we're doing this for the Constitution. Well, the Constitution says you can't inflict a, a, an aggressive war on another country that doesn't attack you and you need to have... Congress and the Senate vote with you to go to war with another country, unless you're attacked, in which case the president has such a, a reactionary powers. But if you want to go to war in another country, like you want to go to war in Syria and occupy Syria or any other country around the world that they're doing it in, and they say, screw you, then you need to go and get congressional approval. Where's that? It doesn't matter whether you're looking at the Democrats or the Republicans. That doesn't change. 
How much have they sent Ukraine? And when you think about, let me get the figure how much, how much uh, total US, total US lethal aid they're calling it, aren't they? Have, have you heard? They're calling it lethal aid. <laughs> Oh, uh, lethal aid. You mean missiles? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. And what what are you doing to what did you do to prisoners? Oh yeah, we enha we we uh we used enhanced interrogation on them. Enhanced interrogation, really. All oh, right. Well, so what's that? Uh yeah, it's, it's basically when you hold them down and waterboard them or you deny them food or you stand up. So torture them. No, and enhanced interrogation, really. So you're not sending weapons and, and military assistance and you're not having a proxy war in Ukraine. No, we're sending lethal aid. <laughs> uh, the US announces $800 million more from military aid. More in military aid. When's this from? When's this from? August the 19th. It will give scan Ukraine Scan Eagle surveillance drones, mine resistant vehicles, anti armor rounds, and howitzer weapons to help Ukrainian forces regain territory and mount a counter offensive against Russian invaders. A senior defense official told reporters that a new $775 million aid package will include 15 Scan Eagles, blah, blah, blah. How many billions? 10.6 billion. The latest aid comes as Russia's war on Ukraine is about to reach its six month mark. It brings the total US military aid to Ukraine to about 10.6 billion since the beginning of the Biden administration, right? That they've sent Ukraine. The most corrupt country in the world. And that's not me. That's not, I mean, it is my opinion. But it's based on the reporting of The Guardian, of The New York Times, The Washington Post, The BBC, the lot. Here's an article in The Guardian. Welcome to Ukraine. It's from 2015, the most corrupt nation in Europe. And then there was the... Um, that was 2015. That's as far as back as 2015 they were calling it the most corrupt country in Europe, The Guardian were. But we've had, um, we've had the the... Is it Pandora Papers? We had the Pandora Papers, didn't we? Pandora Papers. This is from the OCRP. It was a massive uh, piece of a massive report. This was by uh, you know a consortium of journalists all over the world. It wasn't just wasn't just one you know journalist. This was a consortium of journalists. This is at the OCRP. Pandora Papers reveal offshore holdings of Ukrainian president and his inner circle. Ukrainian president Vladimir Zelensky wrote to power on pledges to clean up the Eastern European country. But the Pandora Papers, I knew a girl called Pandora once. Didn't get to see her box though. Pandora Papers reveal he and his close circle were the beneficiaries of a network of offshore companies, including some that owned expensive London property. This is the president and his... Pals, I've, re I've reported about this before, but this is from the 3rd of October 2021. So as recently as last year, the, 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 the mainstream media were calling Ukraine the most corrupt country in the world. And we know that there is all sort of corruption going on there. And it's all being hidden in, you know, places like the British Virgin Islands and the Cayman Islands and Bermuda and all these, you know, tax havens and intricate banking systems in the, that have been set up at the remnants of the British Empire. Do you think any prime minister is going to stop any of that? Of course not. We probably, we probably, I think we're, we're probably supporting it in the UK because we're impressed. Well, they're the most corrupt nation on earth. Well, but that's no good. We have to learn what they're doing so we can profit from it. Maybe we were behind it all, 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 all along. I don't know. But they've sent billions to Ukraine. Billions. This the most corrupt country in the world to fight a proxy war against Russia that's driving energy prices up through the roof. There is no feasible way Ukraine is going to win this war. 
But then, you know, I've I've started calling Ukraine Ukrainistan. Because when Afghanistan ended, they had to have some way of washing money out of <laughs> what is it? Julian Assange said, washing money out of uh, Western companies through Afghanistan or Ukrainistan and back into the arms of a transnational global elite. And they're doing this all the time while the president of the United States is standing there and he's going, yeah, um, we're, we're having to do all this in the name of democracy. And we're having to do it all. Uh, we're having to come down on people and anybody who basically says anything now, anything about anything that we don't like, we're going to take away their, their, their right to say it and we're going to silence them. You're doing the very thing that the Constitution is there to protect. You're violating it and saying that you're protecting the Constitution while doing it. And having this fake Punch and Judy show between the Democrats and the Republicans. And over here, it's the Conservatives and Labour. It's a fake Punch and Judy show. So, um, yeah, ignore this guy. He's spreading Russian propaganda, says Ardich. Okay. Do you want to elaborate on that, Ardich? What makes what makes me spread it spread what means what 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 constitutes Russian propaganda? Has anything that I've said been false? Is that what's called Russian propaganda these days? Anything that's true that you don't like? Because if that's the case, then that's a really scary, scary, scary uh, hole you want to go down, isn't it? How do I feel about Russia, says Milam Defoe? Um, well, I've met a, I've met a few people from uh, that they weren't Russian; they were actually um, from Latvia and Li Lithuania, but old Soviet states. But that's really the only interaction that I've had with Russians personally. Um, I've done a, done some stuff for RT in the past and Sputnik, um, just simply because nobody in the UK was going to pay me. You know, the truth doesn't pay in the UK if you're a journalist. Um, but other than that, I think what I feel is this. People really need to learn their history. That's the truth. Everything that you're saying, says Jadich, you forgot Ukraine are Nazis. I didn't say Ukraine are Nazis. I didn't say that. See now you're saying see now you're saying I said Ukraine and Nazis and I didn't. Do you see? You're saying I'm spreading Russian propaganda. I've asked you for an example, and you've said everything you're saying, you forgot Ukraine and Nazis. So you've pointed out something I didn't say. Isn't that telling? So to go back to the, the question, sorry Ardich, I'm gonna block you if you carry on with your nonsense. How do you feel about Russia? says Milim Defoe. Um I think people need to learn their history, and especially the history when it comes to World War II. I'm a student of World War II. I'm a student of war, actually. I, I used to have, um, you know, the airfix models. I used to, used to do those when I was a kid. Uh, I used to glue them and paint them. I used to have them hanging from string um, uh, over my bed. They were like, they were my mobile. Um, Russia. The reason the Nazis lost World War II, the reason Germany not lost World War II, rather, the reason Hitler lost World War II, was Russia. Don't believe me? Churchill said that it was Russia and Stalin that broke the back of the Wehrmacht, which is the German name for their uh, military machine at the time, the Wehrmacht. It was Russia that it wasn't how many how many let's go back to the comments again quick pop quiz how many americans and british combined in world war ii lost their lives go without looking it up 
in this well, 80 of you watching, how many bet between America and the US, and this is civilians as well as servicemen, how many were killed in World War II? Go. Let's have some guesses. 450,000 says gifts are, 400,000 says user. Around 1 million says gosh damn libs. Very good. The, the, those, those guesses were very good. It's about 400,000, 500,000 from the east side and combined it's about a million. You think, you think it's less than a million actually. So really good. You're educated. My audience are educated. I think other people need to educate. Other people need to educate themselves. How many Russians died during World War II? We've had one guess of 20 million so far. 40 to 50 million, a million size user. Now, it was 27 million, according to the statistics that I've looked at. 27 million Russians. Now, they had a, a non-aggression pact at the beginning of um, World War II, Stalin and Hitler did. They had a non-aggression pact. But just as... People in the UK always told Stalin, listen, there is no being friends with this person. Why? Because, well, with the expansion, he's going to need resources. And one of the reasons why there's any war anywhere around the world, if you just look at history, well, the reason Germany invaded Russia in World War II was because they needed the resources. And the first war, really, other than the Battle of Britain that they lost was Stalingrad. And the Battle of Stalingrad is, is just incredible when you actually think about the Russian army didn't even have enough guns to put in the hands of their soldiers. They didn't, they didn't even have like one gun for two soldiers, I think, in, in some of the battles in Stalingrad. Their, their soldiers were told to advance forward and charge at the enemy, even though they didn't have a rifle, because the chances are the front line were going to get shot and you could pick up theirs. And if you took, if you took one step backwards, there was a standing order from Russian uh, military men. If you took one step backwards because you had no gun and you were charging at the enemy, they would shoot you. Your own side would. But Stalingrad, they won. They held out. Four million German soldiers died. Four million. It was incredible. There were, there, I think it was four million soldiers complete that died anyway. And that was what broke the back of the German machine. They'd split off from Stalingrad to try and go down to the south to capture the oil fields. Like I say... Pretty much every war is about resources, even in the world now. And then, as Germany retreated, uh, retreated, literally, I think it was four weeks later, you know, this big push that Stalin had in the east, we then had D-Day and pushed from the west. And it was sort of combined, you know, the timing of the two between us and Russia to defeat the Nazis in World War II. That's what I think about Russia. All this Russophobic nonsense over the last five or six years, it really, I wonder whether these people actually know any facts about history whatsoever. Because, I mean, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not singing Russia's praises. But if you actually look at history, let's have a look at the scoreboard, shall we? How many, how many people in foreign lands, innocent people of Russia killed in the last 20 years and how many of the West and the UK? And Let's have a scoreboard, shall we? That's what I feel about Russia. It's not that I'm being pro-Russia. It's just that we're meant to hold ourselves up to a higher standard than this. And right now, they're, sh they're putting us to shame. So if that's Russian propaganda, well, it just sounds to me like that's a truthful opinion based on facts is now somehow unmentionable and you can't say what the truth is. Well, that's a, I, I'm really scared if you want that sort of world to live in. Because I tell you who would really enjoy to live in that sort of world. 
dictatorships. <clears throat> Ditch again, do you know what's happening in the here and now, targeting the most vulnerable children and elderly? I assume you're talking about Ukraine. And if that's the case, Ardich, Ardich too, I agree with you. It's terrible. It's awful. War is awful. But it, I'm pro-human rights, not just for Ukrainians, okay? I'm pro-human rights wherever I, they're being violated around the world, not just when the people are white Europeans. I have been reporting on human rights violations in Venezuela, where the sanctions in Venezuela by America are targeting the most vulnerable and children and the elderly. There's a, there's a report by Jeffrey Sachs. Sanctions have killed 400,000 Venezuelans. Did you know that? Democracy now, there you go. US sanctions have killed 400,000 in Venezuela alone. This is just in the last few years. Yeah, it's terrible. If that's what Russia are doing in Ukraine, it's awful. But what do you think sanctions on Venezuela, what do you think, who do you think they're targeting? They're targeting the most vulnerable, the children, elderly, people who are sick. That's who they target. They target them on purpose to try and, you know, create unrest in that country to topple the government. That's what sanctions are. They're America and, and the West trying to bitch slap other countries and knock them into shape. And people die everywhere around the world. And they have been for years. And our country, our media, the media in the UK and the US ignore it. I've reported on it for years. For years. Go to my YouTube channel. You will see. The war in Yemen is just up until last year, the United Nations called it the largest humanitarian crisis on the planet. It, there was the largest outbreak of cholera ever, ever in 2020. And the Saudi Arabians, using our planes and weapons that the UK sell them, were bombing the Yemeni water towers to exacerbate the problem. And bombing any clinics that actually looked after People who were suffering from cholera. Millions have been displaced. Something like 18 million of the population are borderline starva starving right now in a war that we support. What is the difference between a Yemeni child and a Yemeni elderly person or a vulnerable person in Yemen or Syria or Palestine what is the difference between those children and those elderly people and the children that are in Ukraine and the elderly in Ukraine suffering right now? What's the difference? Is it literally the colour of their skin? Because if so, that is disgusting. Still think I'm spouting Russian propaganda? <sighs> I'm sorry, everybody. And I know my sympathies to you, Ardich. If you feel this way, I must. I don't. I don't want to have a go at you. And I'm sorry if I got. I wasn't shouting at you. Okay, but it's so frustrating when to see people like yourself because if you have that opinion I feel as if you've been victimized by propaganda yourself do you know I feel as if you're a victim of actually UK and Western propaganda telling me that I'm a victim of Russian propaganda when all I'm doing is saying listen the shit that's been going on in Ukraine I've been reporting on that in other countries for the last five, six years, and I've been doing it constantly to the detriment of my mental health. And then to see somebody saying that I'm spouting Russian propaganda, when all I'm doing is just trying to say, listen, look at the hypocrisy here of it all. 
And can't you see that we are the ones who are being divided here so they can keep the power? Saying that they're standing up for democracy and democratic values and the Constitution when really they're shitting all over it. Man, I've seen some videos coming out of Yemen that were, honestly, I've seen videos coming out of Yemen that literally made my missus cry like a baby. And just, I looked at, I was horrified. It was after the United States bombed that bus. Sorry, the, the, I said the United States, Saudi Arabia bombed that bus with a Lockheed Martin missile. Just blew up kids. And I, I saw the, the family, the father holding his child up. I'll never forget it. The image is burned in my brain. But they won't show that. If that happened in Ukraine, it would be plastered all over the media. And yet the media look at me, will look at me and go, oh, he's a conspiracy theorist. He's talking nuts. Well, it's no wonder that health, mental health problems are so prevalent these days, isn't it? When you've got people gaslighting you to that degree. Again, I, 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 listen, I don't want to, I don't want to count it. No, I won't. So I won't, I won't carry on talking to you. I've said my piece. I've been as honest as I can. Well, yeah, we can talk about Syria if you want, Ardi. Should we talk about Syria? And the third of Syria that's being occupied right now? The resource-rich part of Syria? Trump said he was going to keep the oil. They're keeping the oil. Is it any different under Biden? <laughs> Thank you, Vanilla Extract. You know, I'm in my 60s, says Vanilla Extract, and I've been aware of this selective government empathy for a long time. You have nothing to, uh, I, I'm assuming, uh, you have nothing to be uh, sorry for. Um, it's, it's, if you're in your 60s as well, it's, it's comments like that that keep me going, that keep me sane, you know? Because it's really difficult to, you know, have these opinions when, like, every supposed, you know, trusted avenue of information is just rubbish it's just they're looking through the lens of the world i don't know how how they can look at look at the world through that lens with that i mean the lens must be so distorted it's like i said the rest of the world thinks america are the biggest threat to world peace Article in Democracy Now! More than 400,000 people have died in Venezuela since 2017 as a result of US sanctions. That's the conclusion of a new report by the Center for Economic and Policy Research and the, economy, and the economist Jeffrey Sachs. Jeffrey Sachs is a highly respected and intelligent man. Um, he went on MSNBC and just wiped the floor with the hosts with uh, just a load of truth about Syria and Operation Timber Sycamore. Um, that's pretty much what's been going on over there. And, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there, are, there are people in the chat right now who would love me to talk about stuff going on in Ukraine. It's terrible what's going on in Ukraine. Yeah, I, I, I feel terrible for them. I really do. But this war didn't start six months ago. And it's disingenuous for you to, for people to even think about that. Because what I'd like to see in Ukraine is peace. That's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see an end to this. 
but nobody else seems to, do they? You know, nobody in this country, you know, it doesn't matter who, which prime minister comes in, they're going to be supporting this war in Ukraine. Like I say, it doesn't matter who's prime minister, our foreign policy will remain the same. Nobody's talking about peace, are they? Why not? This is not going to end well for the Ukrainians. It's either going to end up with them surrendering to Russia's demands or it's going to end up with them being flattened. And the reasons for that are, are paramount. This has not been going on for six months. This has been going on for decades. If you, if you turn the tables on what has been going on in Ukraine onto a country that borders America, would have hit World War Three long ago. You know, I'm not. I'm not talking conspiracy theories here. I can back it up with evidence. There's a there's a, a leaked tape recording of Victoria Newland in 2014, basically handpicking the next president of Ukraine. And all the media concentrated on was the sentence where she said, F the EU. And by the way, America really don't care about the EU at all. The prices, the gas prices right now and the problem with the gas in the EU, America really don't care about them. And, that, you know, you need to talk about the history in these countries if you want to actually fix the situation. And nobody wants to in this country, do they? Or America or Ukraine. I heard... I'm not sure whether this is true, but I did hear that there is a video circulating that's got millions of views. And I can't find it for the life of it, but it's got millions of views in China. Um, I think on their what their social media network. And I can't find it for the life of me. But it, so if anybody's got it, a link to it, please send it to me and my um, email address. By the way, if you haven't already, sign up to my mailing list. Um, go to my website, sign up. But apparently it's 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 soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers who are telling you uh, Zelensky in no uncertain terms, you've led us to the slaughter, like lambs to the slaughter and you've abandoned us in trying to find it. But there are real people who are losing their lives over this. Nobody wants an end to it, seemingly. I do. Just same as I want to an end to the wars in Yemen and Syria and elsewhere around the world and the end to the sanctions and the end to just... Western hegemony. The Saudis have been forced to stop their aggression against Yemen, but you ignore that. Um, there, is a, there is a very... No, I don't ignore that. Has the war ended? There's a... There's a, there's a, a, a a delicate ceasefire at the moment, just simply because this is a humanitarian crisis. But have you heard the latest with Yemen? Have you heard that France is going to go over to Yemen and steal its oil? Its gas, rather? It's the poorest country in the Middle East. How would you feel, how would you feel if France just suddenly came over and said, yeah, we're going to start stealing your wheat in Ukraine? It wouldn't be nice, would it? Anyway, I'm not talking to you anymore. Just looking down at the comments, just trying to see some questions and whatever you react to something about what's going on in the world. Which I'll have to go in a bit, actually. 
6,500 likes. We need more than that. Come on. Hit that like button, everybody. The Western governments are broke. War was inevitable, says Willie. Well, I, 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 I think now the, the sad thing is that we've got a... Uh, it's almost like our economies are built on war, isn't it? You know? Um, I mean, if you look at uh, America's spending especially, over half of all their... And, you know... Nobody's talking about peace, are they? they? It must be very profitable for these arms companies, all this, all this war around the world. Okay, okay, all right. I won't block you, Ardick. I'm going to mute you there so I don't have to react to your nonsense. I won't block you because, you know, free speech and all that. And you just, um, but I do feel like you're a bit of a contrarian when it comes to me. And I don't feel like you've given me a fair rub of the green, shall we say. All right, I'm down at the bottom, everybody. Can I mute him too, says Willie? Yeah, I think you can. I think you've just got to hold your, hold your thumb on his sort of, at least I can, I hold his my thumb on his avatar and he's muted so yeah he can carry on talking i just won't see it <laughs> it's all our governments playing games for who's going to be in complete control it's interesting what's going on in holland at the moment with the farmers that's um when you say complete control you know and the amount of land that these people at the World Economic Forum have bought up in countries and, you know, the, the history of trying to make it so, you know, seeds are patented. It's not a conspiracy theory, it really isn't. They're, they're trying complete control. They're pushing us to a one world government, says user eight through eight. I, you know what I worry? I worry that they're not pushing us to it. They're pushing us to just a one world ruling elite without that are that's above governments. It's not, it's, you know, government gets elected. But if you look at, you know, certain places around the world, it already happens. I mean, nobody in the world has ever, I don't think, voted for Ursula von der Leyen anywhere in Europe ever. I don't think. I mean, maybe maybe they're wrong, but certainly nobody voted for her to be leader of Europe, but somehow she is. Somehow she does policy for the whole of the EU. How did that? Did anybody get a vote on that? It's kind of incredible, isn't it? It's like these people are above government. I mean, you look at the people in the World Economic Forum. They're not, I mean, there's government people in the World Economic Forum, but most of them are just billionaires. You know, and people with dark money all over the place. It's not a conspiracy theory. Don't let the BBC tell you it is. It really don't. Tyne NT says, I just read the book, The Tragedy of Great Power and Politics, and I recommend everybody to read it. I'll keep an eye out for that. Uh, Mia says America don't have the guts to invade Russia. The, the moment, the moment there's any invasion of Russia anywhere, that's the end of the world. The um, the I think it was Albert Einstein who said the last world war was fought with weapons. The, the next world war, he said, will be fought with nuclear weapons, and the one world war after that will be fought with sticks um probably butchered that saying but that's pretty much it as soon as as soon as the motherland as russians call it is invaded that's it it's the it's nuclear time um and this is this is what's really i suppose 
you know, kind of funny that we're allowing these maniacs to go around the world for the maniacal reasons, you know, creating war and havoc everywhere and, you know, doing all sorts of things with all sorts of weapons, whether they be technological or biological, you know. These are, these are absolute psychopathic maniacs that we're allowing run our foreign policy. And we just say, oh, yeah, they're, yeah so they're, they're probably going to end us all in nuclear annihilation the way it's going. But, hey, you know, that's the way our democracy works. <laughs> so if, if people, if people honestly, I fear this, if people don't stand up and if people don't put a stop to this, um, we're done for. I really do. You know, it seems that some countries' foreign po whole foreign policy is you need to do as we say, otherwise we're going to nuke you. And if we don't nuke you, then we'll mess with you as much as possible. In fact, we'll destroy your economy, we'll sanction you, we'll, you know, install puppet uh, presidents after a coup to be or brutal dictators. We'll do all that just as long as we can keep getting our trainers with lights in the heels for $6.99. And it's it's funny when you actually look at it like that. It's it's sad that all this is going on around the world, but don't blame me. I want an end to it all. I feel as if we if we don't stand up, it's going to it's going to be the end of it. It's going to be the end of it all. Trump got a lot of people to believe in conspiracy theories, kind of like Y2K. Um, <laughs> the USA is the inbred birth child of the UK, so solid, solitary kid. Uh, John Sarna says Trump got a lot of people to believe in conspiracy theories. I think people, a lot of people believe in conspiracy theories um, before that. Um, it's like... I don't, I don't feel as if everybody who supported Trump was a conspiracy theorist. Same as I don't think that everybody who was a uh, racist supported Trump or every Trump supporter was a racist. And I don't believe that every Trump supporter, you know, was thick. But if you were a thick racist conspiracy theorist, there's no doubt about it. You supported Trump, you know. It was kind of it's kind of like that. Now, I'm not saying that Trump supporters are all that. I'm not at all. Don't put me in the, the saying that there's, you know, but this I'm kind of saying Hillary's basket of deplorable sort of speech, aren't I? But then I'm not running for president and she was. Um, but he, he certainly played to that uh, electorate in America. And for, for one reason or another, and one reason is the education system, another reason is the health system, being a for-profit health system, and another reason is their mass media is absolutely appallingly bad. Americans don't really know what's going on, and they, they keep falling for these whole dividing, uh, these dividing conquer tricks. You know, people who are pro-Trump right now are, are screaming about the radical left and saying that's Biden. Biden's not left. He's not left anything. If you actually look at his look at his policy and go policy for policy, he's almost exactly the same as Margaret Thatcher is when it comes to being a politician. And Margaret Thatcher was not a lefty. She certainly wasn't a radical lefty, you know. But somehow this divisive con uh, this divisive rhetoric. Is, is is confusing people and keeping them placid enough that they won't actually rise up. And, that, you know, I, this thing, that, that Biden speech that I talked about, I do feel as if they, he was, he, just as Trump did that, he's doing the same thing, but sort of on the different side of the screen. Do you, do you know what I mean? Trump... Is getting a lot of people, people to believe in conspiracy theories, and it's a very divisive rhetoric from Trump with things. It's the same now with Biden, and he's 
demonizing what they call a MAGA Republican. Well, what's a MAGA Republican? It's going to be anybody who says anything that uh, about election fraud, um, maybe, or somebody who maybe believes in a, any sort of conspiracy theory, no matter how truthful that is. But, I mean, are they going to start banning people who um, want to talk about Hunter Biden's laptop? Because that was a truthful story that they suppressed right before the election that his intelligence services, that the FBI and whatever, suppressed before the election. Had that story come out into the mainstream and all the details of the, of the stuff that's on that laptop that I've talked about with the corruption in Ukraine. You want to talk about Ukraine? Fine. I've been talking about Ukraine for a while. Let's talk about Hunter Biden and being, you know, and him being on an energy board in the Ukraine whilst it's getting transit payments from pipelines going through into Europe. And then let's talk about whole 10 for the big guy and all his dealings in China and how it looked like his dad was connected to that whole 10 for the big guy, like I said. Let's talk about, you know, I mean, I haven't talked about the stuff on the laptop with regards to, you know, all his drug stuff and what have you. I'm not interested in that, really. It's funny, I'm supposed to look at him, you know, pointing a gun at a camera. And I think that was his phone that was got, that got hacked, wasn't it? And him weighing his drugs and arguing with the, his prostitute about the whole drug dealer about the weight of his crack. But, you know, that, that, those are personal flaws, you know. I've had my problems with addiction like anybody else, like many other people were that. So I'm not going to judge him for that. But with regards to the corruption, the corruption, and not just that, but there was also stuff with regards to minors that was very worrying. Accusations from within his own family. Yes, I can't say too much because of TikTok, obviously. So is anybody who wants to talk about that, are they going to be labelled now a MAGA Republican and some sort of terrorist <laughs> by the Biden administration? So, but you can see what I mean. You, they're trying to create division here along lines that really, you know, they're drawing those lines. Nobody else really is. If you actually, the, the, the most, the, the videos that stand out for me, not just in the UK, but also in America as well, are the supporters who, you know, they get together at one of these opposing rallies. And I've seen a few now where they actually talk to each other. And when they talk to each other, they realize, oh, wow, we actually agree on 95% of shit. We agree that we should stop the wars. We agree that Julian Assange should be released. We agree that the First Amendment and Second Amendment should be upheld. We agree that actually, yeah, unconstitutional spying on every American that's going on right now, that's bad. We agree that it should be stopped. We agree that parallel construction as a result of that unconstitutional spying is terrible. We agree that the FBI shouldn't be, you know, concocting all sorts of plans where the seven FBI agents and one stupid guy with a manifesto. We agree that all that needs to stop. But the 5% that we don't agree on, I don't know, maybe birth rights and the transgender issue, those are the main things. I, re I did a video, I remember, a couple of years ago when the whole anti-Semitism crisis in Labour was at its height. And I remember saying, actually, if you, went, if you looked at a poll and you went around and you asked people, just what's the, what's the thing that politically is the most important to you? What's most important to you right now? They would go education, they would go healthcare, they would go uh, policing, they would go f the, the, the fire, blah, 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 blah. The anti-Semitism crisis would about, have been about 50th on the list. If you actually asked people up and down the country, it would have been quite low. Let's say it was 15th, right? Even with all the propaganda. Well, I mean, why then was it the number one story for like the whole of Jeremy Corbyn's premiership well premiership the whole of his uh, stay as leader of the Labour Party what was that the number one issue aren't you just actually propping something up that isn't really 
I mean, I'm sure anti-Semitism is a problem, and I'm not saying that wasn't there in the Labour Party. What I am saying is what Jeremy Corbyn said all along, and he was right. It was weaponised by factions within the Labour Party to stop him becoming Prime Minister. They're doing it, I can see, in America, I think. They're, they're Right now, they're using this whole Trump FBI thing. They're using it. Or they, it's it's like he's a, you know, um, wrestling. You know, there are heels. They're called heels in America, aren't they? In, in the WWE, the world. So the bad guy is the heel, and you'll get some guy, a good guys. Like if you followed the Rock, he was a he was a heel for a while. You know, that's what Trump is. He's a heel. He's in the club. Make no mistake about it. He's not fighting the radical left. They're all on the same side. They're concentrating on the issues that divide you instead of the things that would unite you and things that would help the electorate. And from what I can see, it's the same in this country. And it's been getting worse and worse. Why we keep following America, anything America does, we follow in the UK. It's been the same all of my life, even to the point where, like, if, if kids in America start wearing their trousers around their fucking ass, it happens over here. Or one, one sock in their bloody, come on, like some sort of gang member. You know, it happens. Why we keep following them is beyond me. They must have us by the ghoulies. They must. They must literally have us by the ghoulies for us to keep following them in whatever they do. We're privatising the NHS now. We're selling off the NHS to them. A private... Probably the greatest achievement any government in the last hundred years in this country. And like I say, doesn't matter which party you get that's going to continue Keir Starmer has already said he said last week didn't he well it's, it's clear that parts of the NHS has, uh, have been sold off and uh, there's no way we're going to reverse that G wonderful How are you, what are you opposing Mr Leader of the Opposition so, yeah, Trump got a lot of people to believe in conspiracy theories, but there are a lot of people on the other side of things that could believe in conspiracy theories as well. Uh, conspiracy theories such as uh, Russiagate. That's a conspiracy theory. The conspiracy theory that Vladimir Putin somehow installed Donald Trump as president and Donald Trump was some sort of Putin puppet. It was nonsense. Um, and it's the media's fault. Um, the education system in what way? The education system in America is terrible. It's for profit. You've got charter schools. Look up charter schools. They're awful. Ooh. Yeah, there's two two comments there. Biden has the right vision, says Kotifa. And then the very next comment is solitary here. The USA just attacked Syria in the name of peace and democracy. Yeah, that's how much vision he has. The United States are currently occupying a third of Syria, stealing 80% of its oil production. Stealing it. It's also holding its wheat, basically, for ransom in the northern part. Uh, not in the northern part, but the wheat as well. They've sort of pulled out of northern Syria anyway. They're in Syria stealing the oil, and some Syrians are obviously pissed off with that, so they launched a missile at one of the places where the Americans are holed up, protecting this oil as it's being st stolen. Nobody was killed. In response to that, America bombed these Syrians, killing like loads of people, I think three or four people, and injuring others, in the name of self-defense. <laughs> Great vision, isn't it? 
Yeah, I'm not sure. I think Cal Tifa might have been there. Uh, might have been <laughs> might have been joking with that comment. That's very true. Don't compare Thatcher with Biden. Well, how are they any different, Adam? Adam Moores? Biden wrote the crime bill. You know that? He wrote the crime bill. This is something that, you know, if this is something that went after black people just so in, um, unfairly. He wrote that. Biden brags about writing the first draft of the Patriot Act. You know that? The Patriot Act, which the CIA used to go and wage war around the world wherever they want indiscriminately without Senate or House or presidential or House approval. Just allows them to do it. The Patriot Act. Biden wrote the first draft of it and brags about it. How is Biden any different on immigration? Those He's deported more people than Trump did. When it comes to censorship, I mean, Thatcher wanted to censor those minors, didn't she? What do you think Biden would do? Well, he's, he's going to go after these MAGA Republicans now, as he calls them, which is basically anybody who's saying anything online that is inconvenient for them. Doesn't matter how truthful. He's pro-corporate, pro-corporations. You know this, right? Those tax cuts that Trump put in, Biden rubber stamped them. He hasn't reversed them. How is he any different to Thatcher? You knew Thatcher, you know Thatcher was a war hawk. How is Biden any different? All right, he pulled out of Afghanistan, but he's still waging war elsewhere in the world, isn't he? Still. I don't see how Thatcher, how Biden is any different. He's probably further to the right than she was, actually. Definitely, I'd say, more of a warmonger than she was. If you actually look at who, who, who got the money over the last two years with the COVID and what have you, and the military, he's pro-corporations, isn't he? He's definitely not pro-free speech. He's pro-censorship. How is he different to Thatcher? Uh, Jonathan Graneman says MAGA is a fascist movement. I think, I, um, no, I don't think it is. I think you're being told that it's a, a fascist movement. What is fascism? You know? All right, let's have a look. So this is Jonathan Graneman who said this. MAGA is a fascist movement. Well, there's in the Holocaust Museum, I think, I think it's in New York. There's a, it's actually in the Holocaust Museum and it's the early warning signs of fascism, right? So let's see how many of these things the Republicans to adhere to and the Democrats. And we'll see which of the two is the fascists. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I disagree with you. I'm going to show, show you why. So first, first of all, powerful and continuing nationalism. Well, that's fair for both parties, isn't it? doesn't matter which party, Democrat, Republican, MAGA Republican, doesn't matter. The powerful and continuing nationalism continues. You have to pledge your allegiance to the flag every morning at school. You have flyovers at your college football. Yeah? Okay. So I think we'll agree that's fair for both parties. Yeah? Let's get down to the bottom so I can follow the chat. Disdain for human rights. Well, we know how Trump um, had a disdain for human rights, and and we know obviously what about his Muslim ban, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But how is you know Biden or Obama for that matter any different? You know, it doesn't matter which parties gets in. You don't understand nationalism. Of course I understand nationalism, Limpling. They will wrap themselves in a flag. 
How is that? How is so so a disdain for human rights? So the Biden administration is carrying on with the sanctions on on these countries around the world, like you know Venezuela and Iran, crippling their economies, making their economies scream. You know, the, it's been done the same throughout each administration. It's been done the same throughout Obama's administration. Obama, you remember, he took, for people who disagree, let's look at the facts. He took, uh, when he took over, there were two wars, Afghanistan and Iraq. When he left, I think there were seven. Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen, um, there was Syria in there, uh, sorry, Syria, Libya, uh, there's a couple of others as well. You know, so if you actually look for disdain, for disdain for human rights around the world and indiscriminate bombing, then you, you know, remember 90% of people who are killed by drone are innocent people. So how is that any, di how is, how is the Republicans and the Democrats any different when it comes to that for a disdain for human rights? Obama tripled the troops in Afghanistan, says Owen Gibbons. I mean, it's, they're pro-war, right? He took two wars, but Bush's two wars made them seven. You could argue, actually, that Trump had a hesitancy for war. So, I mean, I'd argue that's the first two. The second, well, third one, identification of enemies as a unifying cause. This is the warning signs of fascism. Well, I mean, who's the big bad guys, eh? It's Russia and China, isn't it? They're the enemies, Your Honour. Russia and China. Yeah? And Iranians. Sometimes Venezuelans. But it's always Russia and China. So it's an identification. They've identified Russia and China as the enemy, enemies. And that's why we should all come together to fight China. Yeah? We've got to fight Russia in Ukraine. That's, where, that's why we've got to support Ukraine. We've got to all come together to fight Russia in Ukraine. That's not MAGA. That's not MAGA Republicans doing that. That's Obama with a Democratic House and Senate behind him. So how is that different? When Trump was president, it was all anti-Russia Russia gate, wasn't it? And the Russophobic rhetoric. So actually, that's the same as well for both of them. So there's three. Well, number four, supremacy of the military. That's the fourth early warning sign of fascism. Well, the military budget under Biden has gone up. It's gone up since Trump. He's continuing. Yeah, they pulled out of Afghanistan, but they've continued with Ukraine. And now the cyber rattling with China over in. Um, no. Ah, Taiwan, or whatever it's called. So supremacy of the military. Definitely both. Yeah. That's not just MAGA, MAGA Republicans, right? Okay. So that's one, two, three, four. So that's four. Rampant sexism. That's interesting, isn't it? Rampant sexism. The Me Too movement hit both, didn't it? It wasn't just Republicans. It was Democrats as well. Hmm? It wasn't just the Republicans that were hit by Me Too allegations. It was actually prevalent all the way through society in the U.S., and it was obviously hijacked for political means by the Democrats to use as stick to beat Trump. But you could maybe say the Republicans are more sexist than the Democrats. But, you know, let's face it, Joe Biden is not the same. There are allegations against Joe Biden when he was a senator, I believe. There's a lady called Tara Reid, not the actress. Um, but yeah, I believe her story. And if that's, if that story is true, then Joe Biden's not, well, that's worse than what Trump said he grabbed women by. Trump just said he did it. If you listen to Tara Reid, he actually did it. Rampant sexism. Okay, tick. Controlled mass media. Well, I mean, Biden's all talking about censorship right now, isn't he? Right now, he's talking about censorship in the media. So, and obviously, Trump was all about the same as well. He's all about censorship. Both of them are continuing with the um, persecution and the extradition of Julian Assange. 
So how is that any different? You know, you're, if you want to control the mass media, go after the best journalist the, the world has ever seen and torture him. And show every journalist around the world, you tell the truth about our crimes, this is what we're going to do to you. And that was not just the Trump administration, that was the Obama administration that started that. Remember, Obama prosecuted more journalists using the Espionage Act of 1917 than any than all other presidents combined. That was Obama. So if you want to talk about controlling mass media, well, they're both guilty there, aren't they? All right. Obsession with national security. Oh, come on. That's not just a Republican thing, is it? That's both, right? How many times has Biden mentioned national security? This is what they're all talking about. Oh, we've got to protect our, our national security, security. There's no difference between the Democrats and the Republicans when it comes to that. An obsession with national security. Their NSA, their CIA, their FBI, they are the best funded things. If whatever they want, they get. Religion and government intertwined. Well, we all saw Trump with the Bible, <laughs> didn't we? Eh? I think uh, Joe Biden's quite a religious guy as well, isn't he? And what happened with Roe v. Wade? <laughs> Wasn't that under Biden that that happened as well? Hmm. Weird. Tick. Next early warning sign of fascism. Corporate power protected. Well, that's not just MAGA Republicans. That's Republicans as well, as well as Democrats. Where do Democrats get their money from? Well, it's Big Pharma. It's the military industrial complex. It's all the price places you don't want to be getting money from if you're a supposed left-wing party. Corporate power is protected. Look at who got the payouts. Look at who got the money in the CARES Act. Look at all those trillions they printed and just gave away to business. That was, a, that was um, Trump. But then you go, go back to Obama's presidency. Well, I mean, OK, look at what was the big criminal thing there. Well, it was the bankers, wasn't it, destroying the economy? Oh, yeah. What happened there? Well, he had an email from City uh, from Citigroup basically pick, handpicking. And we know that because of. So there's no different there with regards to corporate power, is there? We are. A, we've only got five things left, people, and every single one of them, both Democrats and Republicans, have ticked so far. You could obviously you could pretty much say the same about the Conservatives and Labour over here. That's my whole point, but. Labour power suppressed. Well, we can't have unions in the US, can we? What's to remind me? What's the uh, what's the minimum wage in America? What is it? What should it be? Actually, if it followed inflation from the 1970s, it should be about $22 or something like that. And they've even ditched that fight for 15. Remember when Biden said he was going to go and do 15, $15 minimum wage? Remember on the campaign trail he said that? What happened to that? That never came to fruition, did it? He promised that. He promised a $15 minimum wage. And then when the squad were being forced from people on the left to uh, support, uh, uh, force the vote in that they support withholding their vote for Nancy Pelosi as speaker in exchange for a vote on uh, uh, national health care on the floor and get it into the public sphere and people start talking about a national health care system in America. The squad attacked people on the left who were telling them that, saying, no, we can't fight them on this because we've got to save our ammunition for the $15 minimum wage and the fight for that. And what happened? Have they got it yet? Of course they haven't. So you could definitely say that Labour power is being suppressed there by the Democrats as well as the Republicans, because we know the, the problem that Republican are historically the party of not of the court of the corporation, not the worker. Disdain for intellectuals and the arts. I mean, come on. We saw that under Trump. Could maybe argue that the Democrats are a little bit better with regards to the intellectuals and the arts. But actually, when it comes to intellectuals who are saying anything um, opposing on the 
COVID narrative for certain. Hey, they're all about shutting them up, aren't they? You know, anybody who doesn't follow the line, even if they are intellectual, then. And what's the what's the budget for the arts budget? I know Trump slashed it. Did Obama put it back up? Maybe, maybe the first one that you could say, OK, the Democrats just shave that one. Well, I mean, the next early warning sign of fascism is a dis, an obsession with crime and punishment. I mean, if you haven't watched the speech that Biden made in front of the backdrop with the red and black the other day, go and watch it. That was all about talking about, you know, punishing criminals. And we all know that Trump was the same. I mean, Trump even told police, you know, if you put in a perp into a car and they bang their head, I don't mind. You know, Trump was just terrible when it came to that sort of thing. But Biden's no better. Like I say, this is a guy who wrote the crime bill, something that went after black people on a really terrible, uh, ter terribly disproportionate ba basis. Again, tick, tick, both of them. Second from last, rampant cronyism and corruption. Well, I mean, <laughs> come on. OK, Trump is corrupt. No argument there from me. No argument. He's, he's corrupt. I've said this all along. I am not a fan of Donald Trump. But hey, hold 10 for the big guy. His son being on the board of Burisma, an energy company in Ukraine for years, getting a salary of a million dollars. A guy who was kicked out of the army because of drug problems. Somebody who emails on his laptop, which intelligence services were said were Russian disinformation as basically setting up corrupt deals in China with whole 10 for the big guy. The big guy is thought to be Joe Biden. Well, I mean, if you want rampant corruption, it goes as high as that, doesn't it? And let's let's not forget, Nancy Pelosi is a hundred millionaire and she wasn't when she got into politics. But I tell you what, when it comes to her stock buys and her stock porch purchases, it's almost like she knows ahead of time what's going to go up and what's going to go. It's almost like she knows ahead of time who's going to get those government contracts and has been profiting from it. That's the lead Democrat in the Senate. She says the reason for her being leader of the Senate, of the Republic, sorry, in the House, sorry, not the Senate, leader of the House. The reason she gets to be leader of the House is because, quote, she raises the most money. Meaning she's the biggest sellout to corporations. Well, I mean, if you think Trump and the MAGA Republicans are corrupt, then you've got to think the Biden administration is too, right? And the Democrats are too, right? Last one. Early warning signs of fascism. The last one, fraudulent elections. I, I don't need to say anything about that. I, what I can say about that is... The person who got the most votes, I think about 40% or 60% of the time in American elections this century, didn't become prime minister. And that's factual. That's without me talking about 2020 or 2016 for that matter. Because let's face it, people like Joe Biden and the Democrats, I want you to think about this. People like Joe Biden and the Democrats now going after MAGA Republicans because they have the gall to say that the 2020 election was rigged. For four years, those same people for four years were saying the 2016 election was ineligible because that was rigged. And Donald Trump was elected as president because he's Vladimir Putin's puppet. And it was Vladimir Putin that changed democracy in America. And that wasn't a fair election either. For four years, they screamed it. They're still screaming it now at the same time as saying we're going to come down on any MAGA Republicans who say that the election is fraud, is fraudulent. Have we ticked nearly every early warning sign of fascism for both parties? Um, I think we have, haven't we? Oh, 
Right. I think that's... Um, I'm not deflecting from the Republicans, Chris. Don't think, uh, don't think I'm a... Chris, Chris Rabe, don't think I'm, I'm, I'm deflecting from the Republicans. I'm not. I'm just pointing out, listen, this is a false choice you've got. Do you know what I mean? This me being harsh on one side does not mean I'm pro on the other. You know, this was very difficult for Americans for some reason. For Americans especially, I don't know whether you are American, but it's very difficult to get through to people that just because I'm saying something negative about Hillary Clinton, that doesn't mean I'm pro-Trump and vice versa. Both of these choices are shit. You know. Both of them. And what I'm trying to explain to people is they're playing a Punch and Judy show out in front of you so they can continue dividing you all and taking your human rights from you and taking all the power and all the fucking money. That's the point. Whether they are Republican or Democrat, neither are there fighting for you. And it's the same in the UK. It's getting worse, actually. Over the last five years, a lot worse. I hope people try and I hope people can understand that. And I hope people can listen and talk to other people honestly and just understand that if they say something that they don't agree with, that doesn't automatically make them your enemy as well. That person who thinks that the election was rigged and has, a, has got a MAGA sign in his front yard in America, he's not your enemy. Neither is the person who, who votes for Jacob Rees Mogg over here. They're not your enemy either. Or somebody votes for Starmer and can't see Starmer for who he was. They're just people that have been had their, 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 the wool pulled over their eyes with just a Punch and Judy show. Once you see this for what it is, Caitlin Johnston wrote a brilliant article about this, and I'll end on this. Once you see this false, you know, duopoly for what it is, for the, the Punch and Judy show that it is, once you see it, it's the equivalent of turning on the news and somebody going like that with their hands and pretending with their hands without any puppets whatsoever. You can see it for what it is. These bastards are taking all of the power and all of the profit and all of the money and dividing everybody else so they can keep their power and their hegemony. And they're not doing all these billions that are going over to Ukraine and flooding into Ukraine. Like I say, the most corrupt country in the world. While what? Have you seen Nancy Pelosi's own district? Go and look on TikTok. Type in Nancy Pelosi's district homeless. There are homeless people living in almost every, under, under, under almost every bridge over there. The homeless crisis is going through the roof. I saw one report from somebody the other day and they were saying, what I'm seeing is a lot of wardrobes now on the street as well, meaning a lot more people are getting evicted. A lot more people are losing their homes. You know, there's a whole, did you know there's a whole, like in Las Vegas, there's a whole community who live underneath the city in the sewers. A community. They have beds and bunks and Flint still doesn't have clean water. And by the way, nobody was prosecuted, I don't think, for that either. They dropped everything. Meanwhile, Zelensky wants billions in weapons. Yeah, no problem. Let's do that straight away. I'm trying to, tell, I'm trying to show people that these are false choices that we're being given, and it doesn't matter which of them we pick. Your lives won't get any better. They're just going to get worse and worse and worse. And no matter who you choose, they are going to carry on governing the same way they always have because that's the only way they know. That's the only thing they know what to do. They have got no ideas of how to fix the problems that we are facing right now. None. So what we're ending up with is, as Chris Hedges wrote the once, Clowns to the left of me, jokers on the right, and false prophets telling me, follow me, I have all the answers. Clowns and false prophets. That's what we're left with. Clowns like Boris Johnson. False prophets like Keir Starmer. Joe Biden.
clowns like Boris, uh, Donald Trump. This is what we've descended into because we've allowed our democracy and our sovereignty to be taken by these rich, powerful elites who don't govern us but rule over us like kings and pharaohs. All right. That's two hours, everybody, I've done. Thanks very much for your support. Please go through to my website, sign up to my mailing list um, so you get notifications of what I do. I'm writing a book at the moment on our po podcasts, uh, probably dropping next week. So um, somebody's just said, so what do you think the solution is? We'll get to that next time. How about that? All right. Thanks very much, everybody. I'll, um... Yeah, I'll be back next week. Take care. Love you all. Bye-bye. Uh,